I'm delighted to welcome you all uh, this evening. My name is Axel Threlfall. Uh, I'm editor-at-large uh, at Reuters. Uh, our motion tonight, could AI have saved us from Brexit? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, it, it has been another really, really busy news day, and it's quite uh, easy to merge these, these topics. Having said that, the last time we met here was to debate whether Brexit would be bad news for London's bankers and lawyers. Uh, that motion was carried with 73% of our audience agreeing it would indeed be bad news. Uh, I'm sure many of you here uh, tonight are now dealing with the implications both um, professionally and personally. So hopefully tonight's discussion will be a, uh, a refreshing distraction uh, from all of that. Uh, our real motion tonight, it was up there, uh, artificial intelligence will fail to have a radical impact on the legal profession. You know, there is an awful lot that has been written about this, as I'm sure you're all well aware. I come at this uh, as a non-lawyer uh, and indeed a little bit of a technophobe. Uh, oh dear, you're probably wondering, why is he hosting this thing? You know, ha having said that, uh, and to boost my credentials a little bit, I, I've, I have immersed myself in, in this um, over the past year or so. Uh, I did a, a couple of very interesting conversations with uh, Steve Ferber, one of the, the country's leading AI uh, scientists. Uh, I've spoken to Jerry Kaplan, author of Humans Need Not Apply, uh, on a number of occasions. He's pretty gloomy about the, uh, how this impacts the legal profession. Uh, and I've done a number of panels on the singularity and how scary that is, potentially. Um, so there is a little bit of context there. On top of that, and, and this isn't a sales piece, but I think it's worth mentioning, um, Thomson Reuters is working on a number of initiatives in the legal and the risk space. We're working with uh, IBM Watson to speed up the development of, uh, of cognitive capabilities in our own products, and we've re recently set up a center for cognitive computing. Um, just a, a tiny bit of, of context here. The facts are clear, as you know. Computers are being used increasingly in the legal profession to carry out uh, predictable routine tasks at great speeds. Um, that is unquestionable. Uh, a Deloitte study found that roughly 30,000 jobs have already been lost to technology and plenty more at risk. Uh, tonight, we debate how radical the impact of this technological disruption will be. Now, the, uh, the interpretation of the word radical, of course, is very, very important this evening. Does the elimination of thousands uh, of jobs carried out by junior lawyers and paralegals constitute uh, radical change in the industry, I guess, is one of the things these guys are going to need to debate. Um, or are we referring more to the rapid advance in software that does what humans do only better, allowing AI to offer front-end client-facing services? Is that what we mean by radical? Uh, the increasing use of chatbots to provide uh, affordable legal advice. I'm referring as well to an article I saw recently um, that overturned a chatbot that overturned 160,000 parking tickets. Uh, or further still, are we referring to a possible threat to the, ro to the very role of solicitor or barrister, uh, roles that depend to a large extent on a high level of emotional intelligence? Now, I want to remind you to cast your, your pre-debate vote if you haven't already done so. We've been having some issues with the Wi-Fi. Um, so you could do it on 4G. It's a little bit slow. Hopefully you've been trying this out. Um, and I, there are the the details. You can also text legal debate to the number on the screen there, and then you do A for agree, B for disagree, C for undecided. Um, I'll give you a little bit of time now. I'm going to introduce the panel. That will give you some time to, to make your pre-debate vote. AI will fail to have a radical impact on the legal profession uh, is the motion. Um, as usual, <clears throat> my opinion doesn't count. I'm the timekeeper here. Um, and as usual, we've got Two for, two against. We'll alternate four against, four against. Uh, let me intro uh, introduce the panel now. It's a fantastic panel, as always, arguing for the motion that AI will indeed fail to have a radical impact on the legal profession is Mark Edwards, Vice President for Rocket Lawyer, uh, a U.S. West Coast tech company that claims to make the law simple and affordable, affordable for small business and the consumer. On the same side as Mark is Andrew Bodnar, barrister at Matrix Chambers here in London, Arguing against Peter Waggett, IBM's Director of Emerging Technology. Uh, part of Peter's role is to advise businesses uh, on reducing the risks and maximizing the impact of new and disruptive technologies. 
arguing with Peter is Edward Chan. Uh, at the end there, partner in Linklater's banking practice, noticed, uh, notably a member of the firm's AI working group. Right, let's take a look at the uh, pre-debate result. There you go. So only 14% agree that, um, that, this is, uh, that, we will have a, that, that it will fail to have a radical impact. It's, it's this negative that's throwing me a little bit. 48% of you disagree uh, with that motion, that it will fail to have a radical impact on the legal profession. All right. All right. You know, I might just ask for a, a, vote, a show of hands in a minute. Let me just write these down, because I need to know how this compares at the end. But, I, you know, yeah, I think most of you disagree with this, and undecided 24, so we've got quite a lot to play for. Right. Let's uh, get to our uh, debaters. Um, first up, arguing for the motion, Mark Edwards. Mark, if you'd come up to the podium here, you've got eight to ten uninterrupted minutes uh, to make your case. The floor is yours, Mark. Okay. Hello, hello, everyone. So I'm Mark Edwards. I'm a um, senior vice president at Rocket Lawyer and I run the UK rocket lawyer business. We're a San Francisco tech company, and we provide online legal services to small businesses and to consumers. One of the things that Rocket Lawyer does, and it is relevant to tonight's conversation, is we help small businesses and consumers with automated drafting of contracts. So I will come back to that later. The way it works is you answer a series of dynamic questions, and it generates a customized contract um, at the end. Um, so, I do agree there is no question that legal services are transforming. The Law Society says that globalization, liberalization, competition, um, customer expectations, and technology um, are all going to have a big impact on the industry. Um, they say that technology is changing buying behavior. Even more so, they say that legal tech companies, u universities, and law firms are exploring how the cognitive functions of lawyers can be automated. This is coming from the Law Society. So given these drivers, uh, particularly technology, I believe the legal industry will be radically different in 10 years' time. But I'm arguing against that somehow tonight, so we'll see how. Um, legal services will move online, and purchasing legal services will be the norm online. Um, it, it is for goods already. It's becoming so for services. Um, Legal services, health, other professional services are taking a bit longer because they're more complex, but they are moving online. And in 10 years' time, I think that move will be completed. So will artificial intelligence have a radical impact? I'm arguing no. It won't have a radical, it won't have a radical impact. So if you agree with me tonight, you have to vote yes, which is very confusing. Um, it's not going to have a radical impact anytime soon. And anytime soon, I mean in our lifetime, okay? So I'm talking 25, 30 years. Um, I don't expect to live any longer than that. Um, so how can I argue that, having said that the law is transforming? Well, I'll, I'll explain. So first of all, I want to talk about what AI is and the impact it's having on general society today. Um, artificial intelligence is real, and it is informing, it is transforming society. Um, we have Headlines like IBM's Deep Blue beating the chess champion in the 90s. Um, IBM again winning at the US um, quiz show Jeopardy in 2011 with Watson. Um, in March this year, AlphaGo, this time from Google, um, beat the ninth Dan Go player, who was the second best player in the world. There's lots of more practical examples. So the police are using it to recognize criminals on the London Underground. Um, you can translate text using Google you know, automatically in an instant. Um, you can talk on your iPhone with Siri and other devices have similar things. You have driverless cars and, and so on. So there's lots of examples of AI out there. So what is AI? Um, broadly speaking, it's a machine that can mimic or perform the cognitive functions of human beings. Okay, so let's break that down a little bit. Um, they can a machine that can perceive and communicate, a machine that can learn and remember, a machine that can reason and problem solve, a machine that can plan 
and move with a purpose. Um, and most difficult, machines that have understanding, emotions, creativity. So let's have a look at driverless cars, first of all. So they're obviously pretty clever. There's some rudimentary conversation going on with them. You can get in, you can say where you want to go to, and they will plan a route for you. Um, so starting to get quite clever. Um, they'll tell you when you've arrived and, and where you're going al um, along the way. So, you know, reasonably clever. What's more important, though, is that they can see the environment around them, and that's a fast-moving environment. You know, might be driving on a motorway. Um, they can drive a car. Um, now, remember how long it took you to learn to drive a car. Um, many of you will have failed your test the first time round. Some of you will have failed the test the second time round and third time round. It may have taken you months, it may have taken you years. So it can take years for a human being to learn to drive a car. We now have AI driverless cars. Pretty impressive. That was a tough problem to solve. Looking at language and understanding, I think it gets even more hard for AI to solve those problems. So translation is quite hard for a human being. Um, doing it well is really hard. But doing it OK actually doesn't require that much understanding. It doesn't require a deep understanding of, of, of the text. Humans can translate a text without really understanding it at all. You can give them a technical text and they can translate it. They might get a few things wrong, but they can have a pretty good go at it. And machines can do that as well. Um, have you ever tried having a conversation with Siri or Car, um, what's the other, um, um, Cortana, um, Echo, I think, or, or Google? Um, you have a chat with it. It doesn't really even remember the context of, of the conversation you're having because it forgets the previous question. It starts to get very irritating, and you very quickly realize that it's got no understanding of what's going on. It's just a smart search engine, really, at the end of the day. Um, I could have attached my mic to my iPad and got my iPad just to you know, speak the whole speech. Um, given that I'm reading quite a bit of this anyway, you'll be thinking, why didn't I? Um, <laughs> because I'm not very good at memorizing. Computers are. So I thought, let the computer do the memorizing. But remember, I did actually write this speech, so I do understand what I'm talking about. It doesn't. You've got about three minutes. Three minutes, my word. So what would an AI lawyer look like? Um, I think it has to be like a driverless car. You know, it has to be really clever. It has to, you know, it could be a lay, an AI legal advisor. It could listen to you, understand your circumstances and advise. It could be an AI legal advocate. It could represent you in court. It could be an AI judge and make a fair ruling and sentence you. Um, but what do we have today um, in law as far as AI, AI goes? Well, we have document automation. I spoke of that before. Um, so in document automation, we're capturing a bit of lawyer knowledge um, in the questions and, and the drafting it can do, but that's all sort of preset before you start talking to it. So it's smart, but not particularly clever. We have um, smart e-discovery. We have smart case search. We have smart apps that can predict the outcome of PI cases and summarize, con summarize contracts. But they're just smart apps. Uh, we don't have robot lawyers yet. Machines are becoming increasingly intelligent, they double in speed every 18 months, so will we have robot lawyers soon? No, we'll just have faster apps. Recent studies estimate that only 13 to 23 percent of lawyers' work can be automatable. So we're partially automating simple legal work with smart apps. Why only this? Because an AI legal advisor, an AI legal negotiator, arbitrator, advocate, judge requires a machine that can perform well most of the cognitive functions of a human lawyer. And crucially, there needs to be deep understanding of both the law and the world to advise, negotiate, arbitrate, advocate, and judge. Is this going to stop the legal industry from transforming? No. We just don't need AI to transform the legal industry. Amazon is an AI. Uber is an AI. Rocket Lawyer is an AI. Well-designed, smart technology transforms industries. So in conclusion, I argue that yes, the legal industry will be transformed over the next 10 years by technology and other drivers, but AI will not play a significant role in that. AI will not have a radical impact on the legal profession 
in our lifetime. And beyond that, I can't predict. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mark, for kicking us off uh, there. Um, right, up next from uh, IBM arguing against that AI will have a bigger impact than we think uh, is Peter Wagger. Um, Peter, your eight to ten minutes starts right now. Okay, and thanks, Mark, for leading that off. Uh, I noticed the first thing you did was redefine the question. A typical lawyer, that. Uh, but um, uh, really, what I wanted to do was give you the counter argument. Um, I am IBM's director of emerging technology and have been involved in Watson, so you know that's something I'm bringing to this. But prior to that, I was a rocket scientist. Not a rocket lawyer, but a rocket scientist. So this, for me, was great, because if somebody said this wasn't rocket science, I'd say, sorry, can't help you. Um, <laughs> but the serious point, and why that's relevant today, is that when I started out as a rocket scientist, I was taught how to use a slide rule. And the reason I was taught how to use a slide rule was that, um, as I was told, your batteries may run out on your calculator, so you can't rely on it. And, but really, the important point about that is, is that I've seen that industry completely transformed. The bulk of the time that I spent while I was sat there with my slide rule was working out how to get an answer, not actually thinking about the problem I was trying to solve. So um, now we've got a huge amount of uh, rocket scientists out there. They're a lot better, they're a lot smarter than me because they know how to apply this stuff and how to make a real impact on it. And that industry has been transformed completely. Transformed for the good, I would say, as well. So. Um, from my current day job and from my past experience, I'm starting to see the same signs around the legal profession that it's going to be revolutionized by IT and in particular AI. And the real reason I'm coming at this is that um, we finally in the IT industry started to build machines that process words rather than bits and bytes. They can understand, they understand context and they build within a world model that enables them to reason and assign probabilities to answers. So you don't get a simple answer from Watson, you get three or four answers, each with a probability. Now, we started this revolution with what we call Watson, uh, and it was used to play a very human game against humans and one. And it was one of our grand challenges, the way that we drive technology forward. And having done that, you know, we're seeing a huge impact from the professions to actually see this as a route to tackling several issues. One is data overload. The legal profession, the medical profession is all being swamped by data that's coming forward. The next thing is skill shortages. You know, there aren't enough lawyers, there aren't enough medics out there. And there's a huge increase in the workloads that are coming through. So, you know, there's several things pointing towards um, this being aided by systems such as Watson. Clearly, you know, these systems never get tired, they never sleep, they're able to be replicated, they're able to continue on delivering benefits. And they benefit from Moore's Law. Moore's Law is the mantra that drives the whole industry. It can be stated in many ways, but typically what we find is that performance on a system doubles every 18 months. So that's what the industry works towards and that's what the industry has been delivering since the 60s and will continue to deliver. So if we take Mark's example of putting years into this sort of thing, every 18 months we're getting twice as good. So if you can see some kind of glimmer that there's some benefit in particular cases that you can use AI, we're gonna get twice as good in 18 months, four times as good in three years, eight times, and, and so it goes on. And I think that that delivery of performance improvements is so critical to what we're trying to deliver that at some point it has to kick over. Now, I say, the original question didn't have a time limit in it, so, um, you know, uh, uh, thanks, Mark, for throwing me that curveball. But it is important that um, we're going to see this thing happening. So how is it going to affect the legal profession? Well, I think there are three things that, that it's going to have an impact on. The first one is just uh, the ability of systems to start to reason to be applied at the top level. So, you know, we've got a very poor um, uh, system in terms of its capability for law because it hasn't been trained. But, you know, we're training it with different partners around the industry and it is going to start delivering. You're going to see from my seconder that actually it's starting to build its way up from the bottom. You know, we're looking at taking workflows, automating them and delivering benefits and trying to pass that system on. 
And there's a third thing that's actually going to have an impact on the legal profession. How many lawyers out here are dealing in AI law? What happens with liability and what happens about responsibilities for AI when um, these systems start to take control of different aspects of it? So I think there are three reasons why we're going to see an impact. And I hope that you, know, you see that there. And I'll give apologies up front. You know, I am a geek amongst a bunch of lawyers trying to debate. I, I wouldn't bet, uh, sort of like bet, bet on my chances. But thanks very much. And you only used half the time. Thank you. But that doesn't mean you have more. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Peter. Andrew Bodnar is arguing uh, for the motion uh, together with Mark here. Uh, Andrew, your eight to 10 minutes starts now. Good evening, everyone. Um, to start, can I say, this is a complicated motion. It's really very simple. If you agree with me, vote yes. <laughs> I was interested to hear that there aren't enough lawyers in the world. I don't know how many people would agree on that, uh, but that is perhaps the nub of the debate. The question is, will AI have a radical impact? Now, actually, you suggested that one impact would be there won't be so many jobs for junior lawyers and paralegals. If that becomes true, then it will undoubtedly have a radical impact on the legal profession because senior lawyers were junior lawyers once. And if there are no junior lawyers in due time, there won't be any senior lawyers. But I don't believe that that's going to be the case. I think really we need to address two questions. And I'm very happy to adopt Mark's rephrasing of the question to just our lifetime because it's a lot easier to win. But... <laughs> Even, I think, outside of our lifetimes, I think we have two questions. The first, is it realistic to expect at any time a computer to do what we as lawyers do? And the second is, even if it is, do we want them to? Now, a moment ago it said I'm dressing a room full of lawyers. Looking around, I'm not sure I am. Can I take a straw poll? How many people here are actually practicing lawyers? So it's about, but the majority, the majority are practicing lawyers. Well, if we think about what we do, we really fall into three categories. We have process work, we have detailed analysis and advice, but then we also have human interaction. Now the process work is transforming anyway. We call it commoditization of the law. Can AI help with commoditization of the law? Undoubtedly. Mark's business, a law firm would describe as commoditization of the law. We have a number of precedents sitting in our office. We're able to combine them very quickly, very cheaply. If we can automate that process, so much the better. And if AI helps with the sensitivity of the questioning to make sure that you're using the right precedent clause by clause, so much the better. But that doesn't radically alter the legal profession because AI has arrived. That's a, fee that's a function of a change in the market for legal services. And the fact that AI is helping to facilitate a more efficient, cheaper way of doing it is a reflection of society. It's a case across the board. Every business is trying to find ways to automate. 200 years ago, it was in manufacturing. We called it the Industrial Revolution. For the last 25, 30 years, we've been living through the technological revolution. I have no doubt that long after our lifetimes, history will record the late 1980s to possibly the middle of this century as the technological revolution, which changed the planet. But the second thing is detailed analysis and advice. Yes, a computer can analyze data. Yes, a computer can analyze a data bank of precedents. And yes, a computer can correlate the two. 
but are we ever going to reach the stage where a computer has an understanding not only of what the law is, but why the law is as it is? In the common law world, we have two sources of law. We have statute and we have case law. When you're interpreting case law, you, realize, you have to understand not only what the court said, but why it said it, if you're going to advise your client on how this really applies. OK, there are straightforward questions, but that falls increasingly towards commoditization. The legal profession, the professionals, are becoming more highly skilled. But as we become more highly skilled, the computer need, would need to become more highly skilled to keep pace with us. And the philosophical question is, could we ever design anything that's more intelligent than us? Because in order to design something, you must first understand how it works. But then there is a third, very important part of what we do, and that's human interaction. Very often, people come and they say, I have a problem. I'm told it engages this area of the law. But we need to help them to get to the heart of that issue. We need to help them, we need to understand what it is that they are actually concerned about and what it is that they really would like to achieve. And we talked about translation. Yes, although how many people would dare to send out a letter in a language which is not their own, having used Google Translate? And perhaps that's the point. A good translator doesn't just translate word for word as best, with the best guess. A good translator gets to the essence of what is trying to be conveyed by this sentence. And they'll change, they may change 80% of the words in the sentence so that they capture the same concept in the other language. The second question, how am I doing for time by the way? I have a moment. You're on about six and a half. So oh good. Three minutes. Excellent. So the second question, if it were realistic that this could ever happen, would we actually want them to? Well, we've heard about liability. I'm sure that a lawyer somewhere, robotic or otherwise, would be able to solve who was liable. But three questions. Ethics. You can teach a computer the code of conduct, but will we ever get to a point where a computer can instinctively tell right from wrong in a situation? And if it could, would we trust it to do so? Second is judgment. A computer can calculate probabilities. But when you're exercising a judgment as to what a court is likely to do if there's a dispute, you don't do it by saying, well, there were 20 cases decided this way, 10 cases decided this way, therefore you have a 67% chance that the court will decide X. You would analyze the direction of travel of the court. You would analyze the direction of travel of a legislature. You would say, well, historically the approach has been as follows, and it's likely the approach would be the same again, but... About, about a minute. But, and then finally, humanity. It's very easy. Computer says no. <laughs> we do, don't want that. If 20 years ago someone had said that computing and telecommunications would have combined to make the world in which we live in today, they would undoubtedly have been described as an absurd fantasist. So can we say, our lifetimes or otherwise, what somebody might invent? No. Can we say how things might improve? No. But on the current direction of travel, the current trajectory, AI may well make lawyers much more efficient. It may well make our services more accessible and predictable, and it may well make us better lawyers because we're more accurate and we don't make the sort of mistakes that humans will make when looking things up. But will it radically alter what we do as lawyers? No, I don't think so. I think fundamentally we'll be doing the same thing, even if we're doing it differently, whether online or in courtroom or otherwise. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much indeed, uh, Andrew. Right, finally, arguing uh, against, um, together with uh, Peter, is Edward Chan from Linklaters. Edward, eight to ten minutes begins as soon as you get to the podium. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have to say I'm struggling to um, argue against uh, Mr. Bortner um, on his previous speech. And in some ways, the motion is a slightly artificial one, as we were discussing as we came on board, um, that um, was, was struggling to generate a bit of a debate here. Uh, but here goes. Um, so I think what it comes down to is um, nobody is uh, disputing that the more difficult human interaction bit um, of legal uh, activity is something that um, in the foreseeable future, being vague about this, that a machine can replicate. Um, and I think by the same token, um, none of us are really sort of advocating a positive case, but we're just highlighting that there are liability and sort of humanity sort of like issues uh, arising from um, a technology that is so capable um, of adjudicating disputes uh, and of being able to um, order us to do things in particular ways. Um, but I think in the, it, 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 where we are at present, and as the representative of big law on this panel, um, I, I think what we're looking at is something which is a lot more pedestrian uh, in terms of technology. Um, so um, as a Magic Circle law firm, we at Linklaters have been looking at various bits of artificial intelligence, um, you know, some of it provided by um, third party suppliers, um, and we have also been uh, building a platform uh, with the help of, uh, with the help of um, some technological sort of partners. And, and just to give you a sense of what the machine can do, it probably is just worth um, uh, focusing on the 20 to 30% of routine work that Andrew seems to think that perhaps the machine can do. Because actually the scope of this debate is really, do you think it's 20 or 30, or do you think it's 40 or 50? And actually, even if it's 20, and uh, 20 to 30, is that still material enough to trigger a radical change in the way um, law firms, uh, the practice of law uh, is being carried out. Um, so, so, so just, just a few things as to what the machine can do. So um, the machine is very good at clustering documents. So if you've got 1,000 documents, the machine could immediately tell you how similar or different any one document is from any other document. Um, so that's quite a useful tool um, if you're conducting um, a, a piece of due diligence. Um, you could teach the machine to read particular clauses. Well, actually, read is perhaps an overstatement uh, and comes back to the point um, that, that actually what you're seeking to do is you are getting the machine to categorize those clauses into pre-designated buckets. So to give you an example, take a loan agreement, there's a transfer provision, can I transfer, can one party transfer its rights to another party without the consent of the other party, typically? Um, and um, the answers are yes, no, or maybe it's written in such a way that the machine can't decipher. Um, and all the machine does is effectively to sort of sort out those clauses um, into those buckets. Um, and, and if you just pause there, you say, well, um, it's very powerful when you see it happen. Um, is it smart or clever? Um, that's where you begin to think, well, maybe it's not that smart or clever. But does it sort of meet um, the definition of, well, there are lots of definitions of what is or isn't artificial intelligence. Arguably, the machine can learn from mistakes. You could teach it that this particular one, which it didn't recognize, um, uh, is actually um, a yes or a no. And it will sort of memorize that for the next time it comes across a similar provision. Um, th then I think you, you probably would say, well, it just about reaches the threshold of what one might consider to be artificial intelligence. But it's a very narrow form of um, AI. It is not in the league of driverless cars or playing chess. Um, so, so, so all very, very sort of simple, incrementally steps uh, to automate um, some of the functions that um, uh, lawyers have been dealing with uh, to date. So having set up my story, you're sort of wondering which side of the debate I'm sort of arguing for here. Um, and I think in reality, th there are two different spectrums on this. Um, the first is the technological one. Are you a skeptic or uh, are you quite uh, a technophile? Um, and, um, uh, and the other spectrum is actually believing whether um, no matter where you are on that first spectrum, um, how you think it affects the legal profession. And this comes back to the 20, 30% point. Um, my 400 odd partners are scattered all over 
uh, both spectra. So I should take the opportunity to say that I'm offering a personal rather than an official firm view on this. Um, so e even if you take the incrementalist version of the story, what sort of impact um, can one just about argue would be radical um, for the legal profession? And if we just pause there, you can sort of see it depends on what, um, which bit of the legal profession does what, because it comes back to Andrew's point that you can say, well, in advocacy before the Supreme Court, actually the um, non-automated bits, well, from a barrister's perspective, I imagine it would be sort of rather less, whereas for um, the solicitor doing the discovery, uh, sort of before the trial, you might say, actually, there's a lot of routine um, sort of work that, that, that needs to be carried out. Um, but, but if you just consider sort of the law firms, particularly the ones supporting um, some, so, so, some, of, um, some of you um, sort of out, uh, out here this evening, I mean, typically, um, big law firms tend to organize themselves in pyramids. So you have a pyramid with a small number of partners, slightly not larger number of um, sort of associates and maybe some trainees, but basically um, that the hierarchy is a simple pyramid. Um, and the second observation is that we generally um, still continue to charge by the hour. And, and one of the sources of tensions that the industry faces is this complaint from clients often that there is a lack of correlation between the value add uh, and the time spent. Um, and that's quite crucial because cost pressure on clients themselves um, means that deploying the full pyramid in the way, way that we currently have is already looking quite challenging. In fact, irrespective of the state of technology. I suppose we sometimes forget that law firms in their current state are largely shaped by an earlier technological breakthrough. And by that, I'm referring to the introduction of word processing in the early 1980s. So if you imagine sort of what the world was like before word processing, um, documents had a natural length. They tended to stop at 12 or 15 pages because there's a physical limit on how much or how prepared you are to fresh type each draft. Two minutes. All right, okay. Um, so, um, it, it, so, so you can see that um, compared to what has happened since then, um, you, know, the, you no longer have typing pools, you have precedents that become possible. Because precedents become possible, um, documents have grown longer. Um, because you've got precedents, documents, you can organize yourself around practice area specialization, and you can gear up uh, associates to form the pyramid. So what's changing? Um, the 20, 30% that Andrew refers to effectively shaves off part of the pyramid, possibly at the bottom. Um, so you probably end up with a pyramid that becomes a bit longer, so you end up with more of an obelisk, if you like. Um, and and it's, although it's early, you can see the case for saying, actually, do we need 200 trainees coming to a firm every year? Why can we just not make do with 180? Um, so you can gradually begin to see that actually some of that is beginning to shave off. Um, one of the other sort of uh, uncertainties is how you price for um, AI. And, and we have no clear answer to this because um, we are used to charge by time. Our clients, despite complaints, actually are used to paying by time. If the machine takes 10 minutes, um, they seem to think, well, actually, it's only 10 minutes worth of time. Um, so th there is a difficult sort of balance. So mar market sort of pricing hasn't sort of reached its equilibrium. Um, and also in terms of skills, um, the human bit doesn't change. Human interaction, um, analysis of data uh, continues to be in place. Um, but one of the changes that we're finding is that um, whereas when I was growing up as a trainer, as a rite of passage, you mastered what was in the data room, there are probably a few hundred documents. Today's data rooms are, first of all, virtual, so you don't even have a sense as to how big they are. They have several thousand documents, but you still need to manage the amount of data and coming back to the point on data overload. Um, AI is the only way to allow the law firm to do this, and it's not just about the 20% um, that may be automatable, um, but you need to do that to preserve the judgment to give the rest of the service. We've got to wrap. Okay. So, so all in all, um, I would urge you all to um, vote against the motion. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you very much uh, indeed to uh, all of our speakers this evening. I'm going to open it up now.
to the floor for some questions and answers. Um, so let me throw it out there. There is a microphone roving. Um, clearly, there's a, uh, this is a, a hot topic. There's a lot of debate here. So let's have some questions from you guys. And then I, I will give these guys a little bit of uh, a chance to take issue with what, what, what each of them is saying as well. Go ahead. There must be a question in this audience. Somewhere. No? Have you all decided? <laughs> yes, they've all decided. Uh, yes, lady in the front here. She'll, she'll get the things going there. Try again? No. 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 Maybe I can just... Yeah, there you uh, go. Now go. Um, I noticed that the debate focused quite, on lo quite a lot on data and managing the huge amount of data that we have nowadays, notably with the work documents getting longer and longer. So I was just curious to hear, perhaps mostly from Peter, what's the relationship between AI and big data? Sure. Um, I mean, it's an interesting point. And, you know, I think you know, we reached the point where physically humans could not cater for the amount of data that's coming out. If you look at the number of journals that are published, the number of articles that are published, it's grown exponentially. We have to accept the fact that we need some kind of support in understanding this sort of data. Big data gives us that sort of like approach into it. We're able to pick out the salient facts from effectively you know, the wheat from the chaff and start to look at that. I would take issue with you know, the points being made on from the other side in that you know, nobody's advocating to replace lawyers, but what we're saying is that there is a huge impact on the legal profession. And it's got to accept these sort of things here. You know, at a personal level, um, you know, I've just paid out uh, six years of medical fees for my daughter. I don't want to get rid of daughter, uh, doctors from, um, you know, the seller, but because I want to get some kind of payback for that investment <laughs> I've made. Um, but what we're saying is that we can make better lawyers, we can make better doctors by giving them the tools and giving them the insight by using AI. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if, if no one's got an immediate question, I've got something on the back of that, because Jerry Kaplan, who I mentioned at the beginning, who, who wrote Humans Need Not Apply, I mean, he, is, you know, he, he will say categorically, he, he tells his, his three daughters or four daughters not to go into the law, because there is no future in the law. Now, we can argue with that. But I, I guess the question for me, you know, with a layperson's hat on, is, is you know, we talk about automation at the, the paralegal and the junior level, but how, how high up the food chain can this go eventually? And I'm talking further out than 25 years. Talking, you know, I've done pieces, as I mentioned, on the singularity um, and, and how, how scary that is. And, and my definition that I picked up for singularity is where non-biological intelligence matches the range and subtlety of human intelligence, i.e. solicitors and barristers and judges. How high can it go? You know, we get to a certain level, uh, and the processing, everything we need to build onto it, is getting twice as fast every 18 months. That's a huge setup. So I see that eventually what we're seeing is that people are having to move up the chain as the lower stuff is actually taken out on the way through. Uh, I think, you know, there's nothing to stop us, you know, envisaging these sort of things taking over from what we've got if we take out that arbitrary 20 year time frame that was introduced by Mark. But you think that's nonsense, you two, what yeah. you've just said? I wouldn't, wouldn't call it nonsense, but <laughs> <laughs> there must come a point, it's a philosophical question, I suppose, there is a point when human understanding of what you're creating reaches a finite level, doesn't it? There will always be a division between human intelligence and what it can create. Why? That, that's the philosophical question, because in order to create something, you must understand how it works. Uh, uh, but um, how did we effectively evolve? It happened by chance, by setups on there. You know, we, we are, there is an issue coming up, and I mean, Mark probably knows this as well, that you know, we're doing artificial intelligence with a von Neumann architecture, the technical term for how we set this thing up. Um, we're now looking at neuromorphic computing. Now in that, we've got the ability to mimic how people think in that we've got neurons and synapses. And when we start going down that route, we do have the possibility of self-learning and self-improving um, architectures. If it works. Um, I'm always <laughs> an optimist. But, but the possibility exists, I think, is, is the point here, right? 
Well, uh, how it's applied well, is another, as we another point. That begs the question. You see, we understand how the human mind works in the sense of we can track the electrical impulses through the synapses. But do we actually understand the process by which that's turned into an emotion that we recognize? Uh, well, we, yeah, okay, <laughs> you can answer that one, but we're sort of debating the science here, which is yeah. getting away from our emotion. But, but let's hear what you have to say on that, in response to that. I think that what we're going to see is that when we judge the outcomes of what the systems come up with and we compare them to humans, then we'll be able to say whether they think the same way that we do. So I think it's, it's an evolving, and it's a, it's a growing body of evidence that you know, we can start to articulate these things on there. Now, you know, once we've trained a system, um, it won't make mistakes that it's repeating um, all the way through. Humans you know, are fairly fallible. Because it then raises something that is more in line with the emotion. Even if that becomes technically possible, do we as a society actually want it? And, I, and, and, and let me throw in there as well, and this is something I've come across, the inherent risk averseness of law firms, do law firms want to take this up? Um, will the take up of this sort of technology be modest in the legal profession compared to any other profession? There's another hmm. issue we can debate here, which no one mentioned. So, I mean, there's several things built up into that. And, you know, I started off my argument saying that, um, you know, there's a shortage of lawyers, and you questioned that. Um, but, you know, potentially, you know, we are moving into an area where uh, there will be balances to be drawn between where we divide the line up and where we divide the work up. Uh, but, um, you know, machines never get bored, never get tired. They're happy doing repetitive tasks. People aren't. Um, if we can free up people to do something more creative, um, sure, that's got to be good. Do you want to say something else? Yeah, so, so w one of the debates that law firms tend to have is, should we engage with this technology or not? Um, there is a school of thought that um, it's cannibalizing our business. What on earth are you doing playing with tools like this? So, so, so that, 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 that is one particular thought. But actually, um, the reality is um, the competitive pressures. So law firms competing against each other, and um, it's what, what you tend to find would be um, a new entrant or somebody wanting to establish a better position in a particular market, a subsector of, or, of the sector, decides to use this to disrupt the competition. So it is being used as a tool, um, competitive tool, amongst different law firms. So in that sense, that has been leading um, the sort of the take up of this technology uh, amongst law firms. I don't think we've thought through um, the further sort of issues um, of the sorts of debate sort of earlier. And I think in, in some senses, I mean, it, 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 I suspect where you get to is uh, hu uh, human ingenuity um, needs to be channeled elsewhere, it would, would be my feel. Um, yeah, it may be that one day nobody learns to drive a car anymore and therefore um, we just have to deploy that, um, that amount of creativity to doing, to doing something else. But there are broader issues, not just affecting, I mean, it, it, if the question is, can um, the technology take over what I'm currently doing today? Well, if it can, I'm sure it can take over a lot of what um, all of us are doing. So there's a broader question there. Hmm. What do I think? Yeah, very quickly, come back, we've got a couple more questions. I was called to the bar in 1995 <clears> at a time <throat> when you could have your affidavit thrown back at you by the judge because it was sewn in the wrong color of ribbon. And various people in my chambers were heard to say, this email thing, you'd never use it for an important document, would you? So yes, if the technology is available, I think the legal profession will make use of it, but they'll do it slowly and conservatively. Okay. All right, yeah. Hi. Thank you, right here. Thank you. Microphone's just coming. I suppose this question is mainly to um, Peter and Edward, um, just to think if AI does have a radical impact in the future, what do young lawyers need to start thinking about in order to make the most of these opportunities? Do we need to start learn coding, or for example, or have a more of a mindset of a legal technologist, for example? I mean, and it speaks to this piece that AI should empower young lawyers because they're yeah. the ones who are going to take up this technology, right? 
So, so I keep get I get asked this question quite often by HR, sort of in the next recruit, what sort of skills are you looking for? And, and the paradoxical answer is that um, we just want someone with extremely good uh, legal sort of reasoning. Um, don't, don't sort of confuse it by looking for other attributes. Now, not, not, not everyone agrees with this approach, but, but the reason for this is that um, what the lawyer will be doing largely is to teach the machine. If you've got somebody who isn't that confident or as good at it, the, uh, the, the, the sort of the risk of the law of recurring error um, is just so great that you just need people to be really good sort of technical lawyers. I suppose the other advantage, uh, the, the, the other sort of, um, it, it's the equivalent of saying um, if you were setting up um, a law firm in a foreign country would you pick somebody who speaks the language perfectly or would you pick someone for legal skill? And I'm saying you go for the person with legal skill. I, I, I mean, really, um, I think there's an interesting quandary here, which is that in much the same way that what we're doing with our systems is lowering the entry barriers into the legal profession, I actually think what we're doing with the systems in terms of their accessibility is lowering the entry barriers of professions into my profession, my, my sort of like setup. So it's easy to program, it's easy to build things together. So, you know, I would see that, uh, you know, the, the sort of like multi-skilled professional uh, would be a really useful asset to have on these things. Okay. Yep, gentleman right there. Thanks. This is um, maybe a bit out of left field, but what is two to the power of 30? You're not asking me, right? No, well, anyone, <laughs> any, anyone here in the room. Uh, it's it's a billion. Um, and two to the power of 40 is, I just, I did the, I, d I don't know this, I used You've the calculator, is a trillion and 99 billion. Yeah. And I guess, I guess what the question is, as humans, we don't know how to do exponential. We can do addition. So two, two times 30, cool, we got that. That's a shorthand form of saying what's two plus two plus two. Yeah. Got it, 60. So, qu so sorry, Mr. IBM. Uh, I was trying to look at for your name, but... Uh, Peter. Peter. Peter, Peter um, to what extent is that massive increase in processing power um, going to lead to the ability to, for machines to um, have those human-like qualities, to reason, to empathize? I mean, I understand the first machine expressed regret of not being a human the other day. Um, I, I, please speak into that a little bit. Well, you know, there is, there's a standard um, test that people are, are using in terms of, you know, can you tell whether you're conversing with a machine or a, um, a, a human? Uh, it's called the Turing test. Now, um, there have been claims that, that test has been met uh, in that uh, somebody had a conversation with a machine that they thought was a 13-year-old teenager. And you can see that, you know, we're starting to get that gray area as when um, you, you can have those interactions. Uh, but you know, again, look at my grey hair. You know, when I started, you programmed with punch cards and paper tape. Now look at what we can do today. And that is a relatively short space of time. And the increase is phenomenal. Again, go to my daughters. You know, they have nothing to do with IT. They keep saying, I have nothing to do with IT. <coughs> and yet, you know, I've caught them texting each other when they're sat next to each other in the back of the car. You know, it, it, they're so bought into this technology <coughs> that they're starting to deliver it. Mm. Um, and I actually had a, a, a chap who left uh, my employ. I, and he came to me and he said, I've got a problem. He said, um, I want to leave. And I said, well, can we sort the problem out? He said, well, no. The, the reason is I, I can't afford to spend the time working for you. And I said, so what are you doing? And he'd built a small app. Um, it actually managed scout troops. Um, and he was making twice his IBM salary from selling this app. So, you know, we're seeing disruption in our industry as well. And I, I think that disruption go, is going to go across a whole series of things. Mm -hmm. But we're, it's all based on the fact that we're embedded into our IT now. Okay, Mark? So the two people are traders, <coughs> technophobe versus technophiles. You know, we don't like technology and we don't believe it's going to change anything. But the debate about AI, we actually both like technology and believe it's going to change the legal industry. What we're saying is that AI isn't going to change the legal industry for a very long time. Um, and we'll all be dead before something happens, and who knows what's going to happen then. And there's a blurring of the line between technology and automation and apps. You know, none of this is AI. Um, 
thing, you know, Moore's law doesn't say that computers are getting smarter, cleverer every 18 months. It says they're getting faster, just faster. So they can process data faster. Mm. Does that make them cleverer? No, just means they're faster. It means you can get a better UI on your iPad. You can play games faster. Okay, I'm going to let that one hang for a bit. Yeah, gentleman there, and then we'll come to you. Go ahead. Hi, Jimmy Vesperk. Um, I was just interested to pick up on uh, the examples you use, Mark, um, for uh, around translation apps. And um, I just wondered a question, really. If the um, translation books um, had had a debate about whether AI would affect their industry, would similar arguments have been used, talked about digital digitalization of print and talking about whether people 10 years ago would have, Joe Bloggs on the street would have a 500 pound iPhone in their pocket. And really why the legal profession is kind of seems like it's obsessed with the academic risk around AI rather than talking about the features and benefits that we've seen dramatically disrupt and improve other industries. So, you know, we've picked off some fairly <coughs> easy things. You know, technology allows us to sell books online. You know, it's fairly easy to do. Being a lawyer, being Andrew, is extremely difficult. Um, to be a lawyer, you have to understand the world, you have to understand law, you have to be able to interact with other human beings, um, perceive what's going on in a courtroom. It's a, it's a very complicated task, um, and you know, computers aren't going to get there um, anytime soon with that. Translating things doesn't require much understanding at all. Right. I, I need to have a better, better dress sense than me, but um, uh, you know, I, I think there's, a, there's an important element in terms of uh, you know, what we're seeing with this AI coming in. And I'd like to pick up on that translation app. One of the things that we did was that we launched a site that enabled you to do machine translation but to have that machine translation corrected by the community that was involved in that website. And that was a really stunning model because the wetware, the people, um, used to be able to correct and make a whole series of uh, modifications on it. And that model of jointly developing things with people into, intimately involved with the IT is the one that I'm seeing, uh, that I'd like to see going forward. Okay, let's have a final question there. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, right here. Okay, feeling a bit under pressure being the final question, so uh, sorry. <laughs> if it's a quick one, we'll, we'll, we'll take the one on the back as well. There, there's been a few references to AI being able to mimic human behavior and being able to learn <coughs> and effectively won't repeat a mistake. But who exactly is going to define what a mistake is and teach that AI what is a mistake and what not to repeat? Because surely a mistake is a very subjective thing. For example, in a negotiation, I often think that the person on the other side is making a mistake, but I'm pretty sure they're not going to agree that what they've just said is a mistake. So how would you get around that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd like to pick up on that one. I mean, you know, one of the game changers we're seeing with some of the AI we're setting up is that we're moving away from, as it was pointed out, computer says no. What we're moving towards is a system where we actually rate a whole set of answers and give the probability of those and let the human decide which one is the most appropriate. Now, what that means is that the human can take the decision, I'm going to actually pick the third one on the list and actually go with that one because my gut feel or my intuition is telling me that's the one that actually makes sense in this sort of setup. Now, what we can offer with the AI is that we can learn from that intuition that's gone into the system. Now, clearly, you know, what, means, you know, uh, what makes it successful and what makes it not successful ca is open to in judgment. But, you know, some of these things um, you can actually understand and track back. The great thing about our systems and the, the AI is you know why it's come up with the answer. With humans, you don't. All right. Look, I am, I am going to stop us there on the Q&A. Uh, we are, we are going to grab a drink afterwards. You can carry on the discussion. I'd like uh, to have the closing statements now from our uh, debaters. We're going to do the same order as before. You're going to get about a minute and a half, so it's got to be really tight. Um, and then we will take another vote right after that. So get ready to vote um, right after you've heard these, and then we'll compare those votes. Mark Edwards, uh, you're up first. Okay. So I got an article sent to me by my wife yesterday about the first robot lawyer in the UK. You mentioned it earlier. I thought, damn, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I need to change my arguments. It's a robot lawyer that helps you appeal, tar um, appeal parking tickets. <coughs> 
can talk to you, generate documents, and answer questions. It's just like a real lawyer, but it's completely free and doesn't charge any commission. So I was thinking, you know, what can it do? Do you give it the postcode and it drives around there, meets you, you it understands what happened with the parking incident, maybe takes pictures and gathers evidence with its robot eyes, and then sends off some sort of pleading for you? No. It's a web form online which you fill in and it gives you a little summary of what you can tell um, as, as a pleading. You know, it's not clever. It's actually very useful and it's saving people a lot of money. And we have smart apps that save lawyers quite a bit of time. Making lawyers more efficient isn't going to change the world. It's going to make law firms more profitable. It's going to make large corporates maybe not have to spend quite as much money on legal counsel. It won't change the world. Technology, however, will. Simple technology, automation, will change the world and will change the legal industry. But it doesn't need to be artificial intelligence to do so. Okay, Mark, thank you very much indeed. Peter Wagger. Um, I think what we're saying is that we're moving to a world where we've got a new generation of computers coming in. They understand words. They don't just process in bits and bytes. They can reason, they get context, they can give you probabilities, they can give you estimates of what the answer is. That's the same sort of way that a human works. Harnessing that technology, but making sure that it's a balance between the legal profession and that technology is clearly the way forward. If the legal profession decides to go a different route, then I think it's laying itself open to effectively having technology coming in from new entrants that may disrupt the industry and may actually affect that balance. So what I'm arguing for is AI working with the legal profession. Okay, Peter, thank you very much indeed. Andrew Bodmer. Well, the first thing to say is that in the history of legal documents, long documents weren't created by a revolution in computing, they were created by the copy and paste function. The, <laughs> <laughs> the debate has been a narrow one in some respects, but, but it was framed as, is it 20 or 30% of the profession that'll go, or 50 or 60%? Perhaps the way to think about it is the, the slide rule versus deep blue. That when you started, you were designing rockets intended to take people to the moon using a slide rule. Today, we have a computer that can play chess. The computing power is phenomenal. But even deep blue can't empathize with a human being or try to work out why a judge is likely to decide or try to, uh, as you develop. So, It'll make lawyers much more efficient. It may actually make us more profitable, as particularly when law firms can leverage their expertise by using the technology. But it won't, I think, fundamentally alter what a lawyer does for society. And for that reason, I don't think it'll have the radical impact on the profession. OK, thank you very much. And uh, last up is Edward Chan. So um, for those of us who've um, been in the trenches and done enough due diligence or just waded through senseless amounts of documents as a rite of passage for every junior lawyer. Um, the volume of data has just grown pretty much exponentially. Um, and the traditional legal response is to leave the problem with the client. So unless you give us the documents in the perfect state, um, actually, we're not going to review them. Um, we're not going to engage with them. But the real pressures on law firms is to accept, as clients accept on a daily basis, that data, first of all, is huge, it's imperfect, and you're dealing with probability. So, so I think one of the issues which we have discovered uh, in our own work is that we're moving away from um, a very sort of binary, I've reviewed these documents, it's yes or no. Actually, there are lots of circumstances in which the client is prepared to say, um, I'm prepared to take um, a, a sort of a series of probabilities that it might be clearly yes, clearly no, but there are shades of gray in between. Um, and if a machine can do that, um, and you sort of say, well, but don't you need um, a human to look over it just to get a sense as to where the precise perimeter lies? Sometimes the answer is no, 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 I, I, we just want a very quick view because we're making a, an investment decision tonight and that's just good enough. Um, so, how we address the challenge of the volume um, with the structure that we have, we can't. And, and, and I think that, that is, leads me to the conclusion that fundamentally the shape of a law firm and by nature the shape of the industry will change. Okay, Edward, thank you very much indeed. Thank you uh, to all of our debaters. Um, start voting now. Um, and whilst you're doing that, I, I'm going to say a couple of things just to give you a little bit of time. First, I'm going to remind you what the uh, pre-debate 
numbers were. So four, so artificial intelligence will fail to have a radical impact on the legal profession. We we're at about 33, uh, 34, 35% against uh, that uh, it will have a radical impact was up about 48%, and your undecideds were roughly around 20, 24%. Um, that's where we stood um, beforehand. Um, just a couple of other things. Uh, do watch out for details of our uh, next debate. We're, we're throwing around ideas for that now. Rights to strike could well be it. Uh, it'll be interesting to hear from you uh, on the feedback forms uh, what you feel. They're on your seats, so I do urge you to, uh, to fill uh, those out because they do help us uh, shape uh, any future discussions. Right. Let's take a look at uh, where we stand right now. And I've got to say, you guys have done very well indeed, because the agrees are up to 51%. Sorry, I've got to crane my neck. The disagrees, 49%, only 1% undecided. Um, Andrew and Mark have clearly won over the uh, undecideds this evening. The motion, I can see. Come on, come on. Oh, look, there you go. There we go. <laughs> okay, the motion is carried. Thank you very much, everyone. Let's grab a drink.